All right. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Phil again. And once again, I've managed to somehow convince the great, the legendary Mr. Ron Friends to join me for another conversation. This time for Thor the Worthy number one and the Thunderstrike story. Hello. Hello. Thank you once again, Ron. Well, it's my pleasure, Phil. Uh, you know, to, for a legend to speak to a legend, it's it's, it's uh, amazing. You know, I mean, it's it's no it's no effort, believe me. Uh, no legend, but thanks for asking. But I, I I wanted to talk to you before this week, but once I read that Thunderstrike story, I was like, oh, I'm so glad we uh, agreed to do this because again, I mean, it's great. It reminded me of the '90s stuff. All right, before I get too far ahead of myself, how did this come about? Did uh did they come to you and Tom or did you guys go with them with like this idea of a story or? Oh, no, no. They, they uh, had already come up with the idea of doing uh, the one shot for the worthy and contacted Tom DeFalco first to see if he was interested. And uh, I was as surprised as anybody to tell you the truth. I mean, a lot of times uh, when enough time has passed, you pretty much, you know, put things away, put things away, put them up on the shelf. And uh, but DeFalco contacted me and said, they're interested in a 10 page Thunderstrike story. Are, are you in? And I, of course, was. And and uh, we started discussing what we might do uh, so that he could uh, put together a pitch. Uh, I mean, the initial offer was made and then there was some downtime because I didn't have any leftover ideas from our original run um and i told him that and he wanted to go back and reread the entire run he wanted to go back and reread the 24 issues over the weekend uh and then we would talk on monday and uh and that's when things finally really started to click because he came back with wanting to include code blue and Code Blue is a it, it is something that I had a, a leftover idea for. Uh, I had long had an idea for a Code Blue, uh, you know, like a B story or something where they where they took on the Gray Gargoyle, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that dovetailed with what Tom wanted to do. Tom uh, was very interested in doing something about the aftermath of uh, Officer Jackson being killed. So those two ideas kind of dovetailed, and we included both of them, which is pretty much the way Tom DeFoco and I have always worked. But uh, it was like uh, like going home again in many, many ways. I mean, I, I don't think we had too much trouble getting into it. Uh, you know, Tom is a pro, and he did want to reread the run before he jumped in and started scripting certainly uh but he also you know he wanted to do it before he even started plotting because we had already discussed the idea of bringing him back but we weren't interested in in any way trying to bite take a bite of that on a 10-page story you yeah know? okay um it's it's something we had already faced with the miniseries when we were offered the miniseries we discussed the possibility of bringing him back but quite frankly Tom and I had lived long enough to know that as much as we love them, they don't come back. So, uh, you know, if Marvel insisted and if Marvel was going to do it, whether we did it or not, and they actually offered it to us, that might be a different thing. But, uh, you know, Kevin's out there now. And, uh, you know, when he said they want a 10 page Thunderstrike story, I said, it's Kevin. And he said, no, no, Eric. And I went, really? So, you know. It all kind of was a big surprise to us as well. Yes, as a continuity nerd, I just want to thank you guys for uh, putting, you know, putting in that it takes place after seven. So you kind of get like a general idea of when this story takes place within the series. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what appealed to us was the uh, idea, you know, what Tom's real real idea was in placing it after Jackson's death was knowing how Eric's story ends mm. we thought it would be interesting to kind of give him this moment uh, where his path could have diverged you know um it was mentioned in the original run that a couple of the code blue people were thinking about taking early retirement oh, you yeah. know so it occurred to us that you know anytime you face something like this uh, eric had other responsibilities you know with kevin and everything uh even though kevin was living with his mother at that point um, 
you know, Eric was never cavalier about the risks he was taking. So we figured it was it would be interesting to kind of explore that moment when Eric might have made a different choice and his story would have ended very, very differently, if at all, and why he would make the choice to stick with it. Um, and we figured, you know, we'll take a, we'll take a shot at doing that in 10 pages. And uh, it was a fairly full 10 pages, but, uh, but I, I'm happy with what we came up with. Uh, and I hope the readers enjoy it as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, as an, as an uh, original Thunderstrike fan, I love this story. <clears throat> and I won't, I won't spoil it for people, but I did love the Spider-Man joke. Like, I'm sure nothing like this ever happened to Spider-Man. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, yeah, uh, that, that was something that as we were working on it and after Tom uh, saw, my, I think it was my thumbnails. I'm not sure if he if he looked at my thumbnails. Oh, okay. Either when he saw the thumbnails or the pencils that he realized this kind of relates to that Spider-Man <laughs> moment. And I, we kind of did our own little take on that. And I said, oh, yeah. well, I guess you could see it that way. Yeah. So that was why he felt compelled to throw that line in there. Yeah. The, the old Spider-Man team just saw that there right away. There you go. But, uh, well, he's never far from our hearts and minds. But uh, I, it was fun uh, touching back with Eric and uh, – and and I I mean there were a few things I mean I'll I'll be honest with you there there is a continuity glitch a visual continuity glitch um, in that towards the end of the Thunderstrike run but it was much later than issue seven and it was something that most readers didn't even notice I updated Code Blues. Uh, equipment and outfits. Oh, okay. And uh, it was more towards the end when he was after he was battling Seth and everything. I think it was introduced in one of the issues where you know Seth had already shown up, and uh, so it was more towards the end of the run. And uh, you know, I decided if I was going to do Code Blue, that I, I think I'd like to play. I never got a chance to really use that design too much, so I kind of used the updated costumes, even though it was you know, kind of cheating the, uh, cheating the continuity a little bit, but, uh, nobody, I, like I said, I don't think anybody noticed the original, uh, costume change or, or, uh, design change. And, and I, and I'm sure if I hadn't mentioned it, nobody would have called me on it on this either. So, uh, well, you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was something that I actually argued with myself about, uh, you know, uh, on my Facebook page, I, I put the uh, the panel that introduces, reintroduces Code Blue uh, from thumbnail to finished printed piece. And if you look at the thumbnail and if you're, you know, way too into this stuff, <laughs> you'll notice that in the thumbnail, they're holding the rifles that they originally had, that they probably would have had if I had stayed with the real continuity, mm. but I updated the weapons to what they had towards the end of the run. And you know, again, nobody, I'm sure nobody would have noticed if I hadn't uh, stuck my big mouth out there, but uh, I don't think it's going to uh, ruin the story for anybody. Oh, oh no, no. Like I said, it's been a while since I read this. So yeah, I, I know I didn't notice now. Huh? I'm going to have to go back and be like, Oh, son of a gun. He's right. <laughs> Well, yeah, I decided since uh, we, we kind of went through a thing that, that, that Code Blue had had their own miniseries, if you remember, written by Roy Thomas. Mm -hmm. God, I forget who the artists were on it. Did Todd Smith? I know Todd Smith worked on some covers. And I know Charles Barnett the third inked a lot of it, but I, I don't know if Todd was the artist on it or not. I'd have to go back and look. But at that point, they had already had their own miniseries and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, Tom and I played with, with the idea that the uh, NYPD was actually marketing Code Blue uh, towards the end of the run on Thunderstrike. We did a scene where they were, you know, uh, Mad Dog was actually screwing around with uh, Code Blue action figures. <laughs> you know, the, the, oh, yeah, the I think I remember that. Yeah. The NYPD had licensed them to the point where there was action figures and and they were trying to make them into celebrities and all this kind of stuff. And along with that scene, I introduced their their new gear. And, uh, you know, so it, it was it was later in the run. But uh, 
but yeah, it was something that I, I liked the new look and I was happy with it. And having a chance to do them again, I figured, ah, what the heck, who's going to care. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, gl- I'm glad I have the, uh, the man in charge of the look here. Cause, uh, I assume it's probably because like the different paper than like back in the nineties and like you probably have a different colors and everything, but like the art just seemed like to stand out even more than like it did back then. Well, one of the reasons that is, is because the editorial crew, Will Moss and, uh, and his assistant, Sarah, they, their intention, this was, this was the decision that was, I was not a part of. Uh, they had decided along with uh, Rochelle Rosenberg, to do flatter color okay. to, to try to make it look a little bit more like a nineties comic, which, you know, it, by the nineties, we were playing with shading and stuff. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it's not, it's not as accurate as they might think, but I mean, they're all young people. <laughs> so they think the nineties was a long time ago. <sighs> and, uh, but it was their idea to do the flatter color, the brighter, flatter color to try to call back, uh, to make it look like an, an older story. And actually, there are quite a few people that are following me on Facebook who actually liked it when I, I ran some of the panels from it, that they were, you know, wishing that other books could be done that way as well. And it, and it makes perfect sense that older fans might appreciate it more than the younger fans. That was my only concern, is that uh, I do, did we really want to call it out to the point that it might turn people off? It might turn current fans off, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But, I mean, they came up with an interesting idea, and there was no reason not to play it through and see how it would be uh, accepted. So you noticed it. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. But, again, I'm an older fan, so. (laughs) Well, Well, I I have a feeling you and I have quite a few years between us. Yes, yes. Yeah, like I I said, I'm 41. So, yeah, I was reading Thunderstrike in my teenage years. So. Makes sense then, yeah. It, 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 and it, it was, you know, I thought it was an interesting experiment. I thought it was worth doing, mm-hmm. and uh, I hope overall people will appreciate it to one degree or another. Um, I've only read one review of it so far, and uh, the person, the, the the reviewer, seemed to appreciate the story and uh, and liked it well enough that he again was was working off of his own memory of the original run. You know, it's not like it's not like everybody went and dug out their thunderstrikes uh, to read them uh, in preparation for <laughs> for Thor the Worthy. You know, I mean, it's not like what people are doing where they're watching the entire Star Wars saga in preparation for Episode Nine or anything. You know, and I understand that. So uh, it it is what it is. I mean, hopefully, if you if this does move you to go back and reread the original stories, uh, this will fit right in. You know, I, I was sorry we couldn't get Al Milgram on board. The oh, anchor, yeah. Because he inked the entire run. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, Thunderstrike was his baby as much as mine. And uh, he, because he joined us the last couple of years of Thor and then came with us over to Thunderstrike. Uh, unfortunately, when he was contacted by the editor, he has, he, he was, that, that week he would have had to start it and uh and and get a jump on it he was recovering from hand surgery oh and was unable to join us and it broke my heart i mean we tried some high profile people and we tried some other people it just wasn't going to work with yeah. schedules and everything uh fortunately uh i had worked with keith williams on several other projects i don't know if you remember his work over john byrne on the hulk and Yes, yes, uh, yes. You know, uh, over Pat Olive on Warlock and the Infinity Watch. He's done some incredible work over the years. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, also, notably, he worked on the, the Phantom Daily Strip uh, for, hmm. for years and years as an anchor. But um, I love his stuff, and he's, he's, he's professional and fast and was available. And uh, he, he uh, is a wonderful guy. He jumped in. You know, whole hog. I, I I barely got the the question I typed out, and he agreed. He he said he was up for it, and I actually think his work is very similar to what Al Milgram did on the strip. I mean, they were they're both brush guys to a large extent, and uh, you know, it's all technical stuff that nobody really notices. But but I thought he very much matched the look of the original run, and uh, was was very happy with that Keith was able to help us out, and I owe him big time. So. Uh, 
you know, I mean, cause the books are budgeted differently now as well. Mm. And they, they tend to, uh, at this point will tell you how much money they can afford to pay for the inker. And of course, you know, for some of the veteran guys, that was, uh, that was an issue, but, but wow. Keith was, uh, Keith was, was undeterred by the page rate. So, uh, it was uh, wonderful to have him, and again, I think he matched the look. So, so hopefully, if if people do go back and read the run, what they'll find is that this fits in fairly smoothly with the original run, and uh, you know, isn't uh, isn't going to stick out like a sore thumb or anything. You know? I don't think so. I'll have to let you know because you said, "Oh, no one's going to go back and uh, reread the whole twenty-four issues." I don't know. I have a bunch of time off at Christmas time. I might have to uh, break out my <laughs> thunder strikes. There are probably worse ways to spend it. I would think. You know, it's been a while since I've read the the originals. Um, the last time I did, I was moved to call Tom DeFalco and say, "You know, occasionally we actually knew what the heck we were doing," and because uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit, you know, and and I was reminded of certain things. And when they send me. They usually send me like one comp copy when they collect the stuff into the trades. Mm -hmm. And as I've been getting some of the Thor stuff in trades, I'll, I'll reread sections of it. And uh, Tom's a very talented guy. He he's a technical writer. He he uh, he's a real craft writer. And uh, you know, so I, I would like to think that uh, we're both as as at the top of our game as we've ever been. You know that kind of thing. So uh, it was it was really fun to get back together with him on uh, on the Spider-Man ten pager for uh, uh, for what was it called the Sensational Spider-Man self improvement yes yes and uh, and for this ten pager it was it was wonderful and I I have to thank the editors for the opportunity Will Moss it was a terrific editor uh, I, I got to see the different phases of his you know, copy editing and and uh, everything, every stage of it uh, now with email and everything. And I was very impressed with, uh, with Will's insight and his comments. And they were all on point. So uh, it was a wonderful experience all around, it really was. It was over too fast, but outside of that, it was a terrific experience. But, I mean, you, you know you two have the magic because they keep – I mean, why, why else do you think they keep teaming you two back up? <laughs> well, actually, you know, it just, it's interesting you say that because – Tom is going to be writing backups for Iron Man 2020. Oh, really? Since he create basically created the character along with Herb Trimpey and uh, and uh, Barry Windsor Smith oh, yeah. for the uh, Machine Man uh, miniseries way back when. Um, so he has been approached to write um, some backups for that, and he contacted me and asked me if I'd be interested, and I said absolutely, and. Uh, uh, C.B. Sabalski, the editor in chief, uh, did not like the idea at all. What? Uh, he wanted, yeah, he wanted to see he wanted to see Tom work with uh, with other people, probably more contemporary people. Um, Tom seemed to think that it was probably more of a budget issue uh, mm. because they don't have a lot of money to throw around. And so, so I think Tom, you know, possibly because he's a good friend as well as a partner. Uh, he may have just been trying to soften the blow a little bit, but he, you know, he said he thinks it's a budget issue, but, but I can see, you know, the, the, uh, preference to, to change things up a little bit. You know, I mean, Tom and I are not joined at the hip. His run on fantastic four was proof of that. You know, he does not yeah. need me to, uh, to make a mark. And, you know, I was, I did Superman without him and I've done several projects without him. So, uh, as much as we enjoy working together, when we get the chance, uh, you know, we're not uh, joined a dab. So. Well, I'm also a regular Iron Man reader, and I would like to see that. So. Well, Continue. when Iron Man 2020 debuts, uh, it's he's going to be doing. I, I think they're ten page backups. I think he's going to be doing three ten page backups. Okay. Of uh, I think what he's going to center in on, if you remember, there were the supporting characters called were they called the Wreckers or something like that 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 uh, kind of helped put machine man back together oh i think so it's been so long since i read that yeah yeah and now that they're now that they're doing 2020 and and doing their own version of it current day mm -hmm. i think he's going to center on those characters and uh and and kind of do the the current day version of them or something i don't know exactly it, it's been a long time since i've read the miniseries as well we never got to the point 
you know, where I pulled that out to reread it or anything because I was told I wasn't going to be a part of it hmm. early enough on that uh, the most I had done was looked at some of the designs for the new Iron Man 2020, but uh, that was about it. So, but yeah, you know, it, it's not, it's not always going to be Tom and Ron, but I'm sure there's going to be terrific stories either way. Cause, uh, because Tom's a hell of a good writer. Yes, he is. But, uh, but speak. But speaking of, well, back to Thunderstrike. Is has there been any talk of uh, maybe giving Kevin his own solo series again? I know he had the mini series, but I know he's and he's been what as Guardians of the Not Galaxy. That I've heard. Well, he's no? been he's been part of the as Guardians of the Galaxy mm-hmm. uh, for that run. I don't know what the status of that book is, or what Kevin's status was. The ones I bought and read. I, I, I'm not up to date. I'm sure I'm not up to date because I don't get out to comic shops that often. Mm-hmm. But I, I do have a handful of the issues. And from what I read, they didn't seem to be all that interested in making major changes to Kevin, hmm. you know, as far as uh, as a character, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was sorry that I understand why, because they already had plenty of Valkyries on board between Angela and uh, and, and the other characters. But there's no mention uh, with all this stuff that's been going on with Jane Foster and everything. I wonder what the status of, of Grunhilda would be mm. um, because she was a, a, a very intricate, not intricate with a, but she was very much a part of Kevin's construction, you know, mm-hmm. of, of the ongoing Kevin stories. Believe me, if Tom and I would have had a chance to do more Kevin stories, Grunhilda would have been very much a part of it. So I was when they used him for As Guardians of the Galaxy. I was sorry that not only did were they not using Grunhilda, there was no mention of Grunhilda returning to Asgard or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and from what I understand, with the Jane Foster becoming the Valkyrie, I think all the other Valkyrie are gone or something like that, or depowered or dead or whatever. I think so. Yeah, I read the first issue. It's, I think so it would like be that. interesting to see what Grunhilda's status is. You know that kind of thing. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, – no, there hasn't been – nobody has approached us about it. Uh, you know, it's nice that Kevin is being mentioned. Uh, you know, Kevin even got a mention in Thor the Worthy that he was the current wielder of Thunderstrike and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just actually dug into some stuff myself uh, at my studio to pull out some production stuff and pencils, pencil Xeroxes and designs and everything from the uh, Thunderstrike miniseries with Kevin that I'm going to be uh, featuring on my Facebook page uh, to see if anybody has any interest in the development of that character and how Tom and I went about it. And, and it went through, you know, it was it was not the, the easiest decision to make. I, you know, yeah. we... I actually, you know, we actually have some ideas of how we might have brought Eric back. But as I said, we decided not to do that uh, because of our own personal feelings at the time and and, uh, that way too many characters come back, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we decided we we like the idea of doing the legacy thing since Kevin, you know, we used Kevin in the MC2 as a legacy character. So we like the idea of basically doing him in the 616 but wherever we turned right with the mc2 kevin we turned left with the 616 kevin you know Mm -hmm. uh so he's a very different character uh but you know it was it was a there was a lot of development in a in a fairly short amount of time a lot of different ideas were uh, because you could go anywhere with it you know because the mace is magic you know, we played with the idea in the miniseries that he could pretty much look however he wants to look. It's a magic maze. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you no, know, and and Grunhilda points that out to him, and he tries on a couple of different looks in the course of the of the miniseries. And because there was no limitation to that, you know, I we, I played with a bunch of different directions for what Kevin would look like as Thunderstrike uh, before we settled in on what we were you know what we thought was was unique and something that would be different enough that it uh it would appeal to the people that liked thunderstrike but also you know appeal separately to a a potential new audience because tom likes to 
I mean, he likes to he likes to do teenage characters because he's he's hoping that we can still interest you know young people and teenagers in the comics. You mm-hmm. know that, that he 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 hopes that young people are still picking us up along with the 30, 40 year olds that we have from before, you know what I mean? So much Mm -hmm. of the material isn't geared for younger readers anymore. So when Tom has a chance to create, he likes the idea of doing something that might possibly uh, appeal to a younger demographic because, you know, we've kind of lost them over the years. Yeah. I think, I think we talked about that before is the distribute, the distribution just isn't what it was used to be either. No, I, I, you know, I, I don't think if, if you're not reading comics now, that the chances that even if you really enjoy the Marvel movies, the chances that you're going to proactively go to a comic shop and and try to jump in. I'm sure kids are doing it all the time, but not in the numbers that we really would need to be as healthy as we were even back in the 80s. You know. Oh yeah. Which uh, when we still had newsstand sales and everything, I'm always very grateful that I got into the business while we still had the spinner racks in, in the mass market, you know, and, and uh, newsstand sales, because uh, frankly, Tom and I always sold really well on the newsstand. <laughs> uh, actually, we, we sold better on the newsstand than we usually did in, uh, in the specialty shops. <laughs> yeah, I but know. Thunder, Thunderstrike was, was selling fine. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, guys. no, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I'm glad I started collecting when there was newsstands because I don't know if I would have bumped into into the books and started collecting if there hadn't been newsstands or even spinner racks in the grocery store. Yeah, yeah I, I can guarantee I wouldn't I wouldn't have started. I, I'd like to think I would have. Yeah. But I, if I were the same age that I started, because I started at like six or seven mm-hmm. with – you know, but you could find a spinner rack in the food store that your parents shopped in. Oh yeah. You know, and all this kind of stuff. And and if not for that, I don't know if, if I would have, I I certainly wouldn't have started as early as I did. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I would have pissed out on a lot of really cool stuff, but, um, but yeah, I mean, at Thunderstrike as a character, I, I, it's amazing to me. I think we've, we may have even talked about this before. When I go to conventions, it, it's incredible how many people were Eric fans. Um, the book sold very, very well. The reason it got canceled, along with a bunch of other books that were selling pretty well, was because uh, of the Ron Perlman deal. And uh, at one point, Ron Perlman's people, who were not publishing people, uh, decided that if you canceled half the line, the half that was left would sell twice as well <laughs> as if they were all like stamped out cans of beans or something like that. Yeah. You know? um, in fact, Tom DeFalco, when he was at that meeting and that person said that Tom laughed and realized that that person was serious. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was probably when, pretty much when he got marked for dismissal. You know, that was probably one of the things, one of the things that got him fired was uh, as editor in chief was the fact that he was not on board for that harebrained of a scheme because at the time when they did it, I mean, they canceled all the, all the spinoff titles, Thunderstrike, War Machine, oh, yeah. Horse Works, all those books were canceled at that point, even though they were selling. Uh, just to serve this game plan. And of course, it didn't work the way the person thought it would work because if if a kid, if, if your favorite title is canceled, you don't just find another book to like. You know, you, you'll spend that money somewhere else. You'll spend that money on a piece of pizza and a, uh, you know, and a Coke, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it didn't work. All it did was uh, it, it, it lessened marvel's uh market presence you know which a lot of people thought they were kind of flooding the market anyway so there were probably competitors who were happy about it but all it did was cost marvel market share uh by canceling half the line so it was unfortunate and we got caught up in it because simply because we were a spinoff character uh but our sales were strong so I think that's the reason that I can still meet people at conventions who really read and enjoyed Thunderstrike. And there's quite a few of them out there because the book was selling well. And and it's not like it was, you know, falling between the cracks. I mean, it it did get eyes on it. And uh, and people, uh, it's incredibly gratifying because people did appreciate what we were trying to do. 
it was funny because, you know, we were trying to do a traditional character with supporting characters and everything. And a nice guy at a time when, you know, Wolverine was racking up a body count. The Punisher was very popular and the books were taking a slightly darker turn and everything. And Eric was not that at all. Um, and, you know, he, he, he wasn't like, you know, some grim ass kicking vigilante character or anything like that. Although there were people who saw some of the covers and assumed that's what he was. But, uh, you know, so, so, uh, he was a likable character. We figure if you're going to create a character that you want people to pick up every month, maybe he should be somebody you wouldn't mind hanging around with once a month. Oh yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think I told you that already is, uh, yeah, you, Tom and Eric Masterson got me in the, into Thor in the first place with, you know, with that original run where he becomes Thor. And I think, Every, you know, he was so popular because he was so re- relatable, like he's Spider-Man. But I mean, even Peter Parker is like a genius. I mean, Eric's just like a normal guy who got hand, handed the hammer. It's like, he OK, here, you're four now. Exactly. Exactly. The only thing that Tom was a little leery of was was making Eric old enough to have a son. Mm. Because, again, he likes to make the character as relatable yeah. as possible across all the different you know, generations and, and the, uh, the different, uh, uh, you know, groups of, uh, age, age groups and stuff. But what we, what we liked about him having a son was the parallel to Odin and Thor. Oh yeah. Um, because ultimately, uh, Tom and I believed that, that Thor was about family mm-hmm. in a lot of the same ways that Spider-Man is, you, you could say Spider-Man is about family because, Aunt May was such an integral part of uh, of the of that strip, uh, but I, you know, Tom especially always felt that Thor was the the story of family. Uh, you know, if you look at the the original run, the original Lee Kirby run, it was you know basically Odin Odin's relationship with Thor and Thor's relationship with Odin, and uh, and the fact that Odin kind of stuck his foot in it by by teaching him humility and giving him a bond to earth, Odin was constantly confounded by Thor's bond with earth. <laughs> and it was his own fault, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, that was something that, that uh, an aspect of the relationships that Tom always enjoyed. And, and we wanted to reflect that in, uh, in an earthly identity in a very hopefully relatable way. And uh, my brother at the time was a, was a father, a uh, divorced father. And uh, so it was something that I was connected to. And, uh, you know, it was an aspect of the character that we really enjoyed. I always took, I always took it too, like when I was younger, that like that also gave Eric like extra incentive to do the right thing. Cause you know, he was like, you know, you know, he was like, I gotta be a role model for my son. You know, what would, you know, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the scenes that I enjoyed the most, were you know uh were ones that involved kevin um when he finally realized at one point when he was when he was sharing identities with thor Mm. before he took over uh Uh himself there was the the black galaxy saga where you know thor realized that he had to he had larger responsibilities beyond earth and it was at that point that eric realized that if this indeed was the way it was going to go, then his responsibilities to Kevin weren't just in keeping Kevin with him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he realized that really the best thing for Kevin, given the situation and given his commitment to Thor was to, uh, to give Kevin up in the custody battle and, uh, and, and have Kevin go live with Marcy. So that was something that I, I thought those scenes were incredibly uh, well done. Uh, Tom handled them incredibly well. And the other thing too, was when we finally had uh, Eric reveal his identity to Kevin um, as Thunderstrike, you know, we did it oh, yeah. in the course of a backup story, but, um, but at one point he just decided it was time, you know, Kevin was old enough and it was time for him to tell Kevin in case anything happened to him, you mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it worked out. I, I, I believe me, I have a lot of very deep affection for for the character of Eric Masterson and for Kevin as well. And 
you know, in this on the same level as with, you know, as for Peter Parker or uh, Mayday or any of the characters that Tom and I have uh, have co-created and, and shepherded, you know. And uh, all right, I'll, I'll let you go in a little bit. But uh, so did did you say in this uh, in this new uh, story in Thor the Worthy that uh, it was Greg Gargoyle was your idea? Was did you say it was an unused uh, idea you had for the it original series? It was an series? idea I had had for uh, for Code Blue. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, you know, it, when we were originally playing with Code Blue, and there were there was a, a, some talk about using Code Blue in backups and things like that. Um, I had come up with a uh, an idea f- for how Code Blue could take on the Great Gargoyle. Some of the ideas were used in the uh, in the ten pages in, in the story we did. The original idea I had was, you know, it was juxtaposing Stone's relationship with the rest of his team with mm-hmm. the Great Gargoyle, and it was called Men of Stone. <laughs> and that's originally what we started with. But as as you've read it, and you know, we don't want to give too much away. There were, you know. There are now women involved in the overall arcing story, and it's mm-hmm. about making choices, and it's about you know making choices in relationships, and so it became uh, Hearts of Stone, and then as we were talking about that moment for Eric, where he's you know come to the crossroads and he could either quit and live, or keep doing what he's doing and ultimately it ends the way we know it ends. That's when it was, it became hearts of stone, feet of clay, Hmm. feet of clay being, you know, uh, fallible humans. Uh, And uh, so it, it evolved uh, for the, for the purposes of the story and for the characters involved. But yeah, and once, once Tom opened the door to code blue, And he knew he wanted to have something where Stone and and Eric were having a conversation about whether or not to continue. Then it became, okay, what's happening while they're having that conversation? What's the dynamic that's happening while they're having that conversation? And so we needed, we needed an adversary and, and I, and I contributed, uh, how about Greg Gargoyle? And that's what we ran with. So uh, in, in true, DeFalco friends, Marvel hoo-ha style, that conversation between Stone and Eric takes place in two panels in the midst of a lot of other action. <laughs> yeah. I t- oh, this is this why I'm like, why don't they give you guys more work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I said, I, I was happy with uh, the conclusion with, yes. you know, uh, why Eric makes the decision he makes because it's a very, you know, he has, it, it, it happens that he becomes, he does something heroic in a very personal way with one of the characters, as you've seen. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he was eye to eye with this, this character when he was called upon to be Thunderstrike. And, uh, so it made an impact on him that, you know, this is a life that, you know, how many people have, you know, there has to be a moment when, when these when these characters are at their lowest that they have to consider how many people they've saved mm. and and what really would be the result if they quit you know how many people wouldn't get saved <laughs> if they quit you know that kind of thing yeah um and that's that's what we wanted eric to to uh we wanted to play out a situation where eric would, would need to consider that and the other only other thing i really contributed uh aside from what we've already talked about is uh, Tom has a, a tradition of ending his stories with the end for now. Uh, it's never just the end. It's the end for now. Yes. And uh, I suggest that if you check the end of the story, it ends with the end for then <laughs> <laughs> because it was set in the past. Mm-hmm. And stuff. I suggested that Tom liked the idea. So he used it and I was very flattered. So. So anyway, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. If you have any other questions, I, I you know, there's no uh, there's no limit. I mean, uh, ask me anything. I mean, I think I think that's it for now. But you know me, I'll probably hit you up, sit, you know, in a couple months. Be like, <laughs> hey, can you come back and talk about something? <laughs> I, hey, I'm, it's my pleasure, man. I uh, I enjoy talking with you, and uh, I'm flattered that you think of me. So uh, anytime. Um, do you have anything upcoming? Any any work upcoming? 
Uh, outside of Blue Baron, I am working on uh, for Sit Comics. Uh, I'm working on a uh, an issue uh, which is actually it's not just the Blue Baron. It's it's set in the Blue Baron universe, and it involves all the other characters. It's called the uh, Heroes the Heroes Union, which is their Justice League, their Avengers, hmm. and uh, it is co-plotted and scripted by uh, Roger Stern. And I'm penciling it now, and it's a terrific story that uh, if you've read any of the uh, Blue Baron material and Startup and some of the other superhero titles that Sid Comics is doing, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a flashback that, that fills in the blanks that of uh, some stuff that came before, that's been referenced, but came before uh, something called the Cosmic Crusade that... Um, that the, these heroes were involved with. So you get to see a lot of the characters meet for the first time and interact for the first time and, uh, and kind of fill in the blanks and you get a, a real sense of who the blue Baron was before the body switch that happens in blue Baron number one with, uh, with Ernie Rodriguez. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's a terrific story. I have been remiss in my duties uh, as far as getting it penciled in a timely manner but I am uh, concentrating on just that now and uh, was working on it today. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really good stuff. Um, the, the, good, the, the really good news is my understanding is that Sit Comics are going to be available at some point in the near future through Diamond Distribution. Oh. So the, uh, they will be in many more shops than they are currently and much more available for the discerning reader, because I, I am very proud to be a part of what Darren Henry is doing with these books. And uh, I think they're very enjoyable reads. And uh, he does a lot of thinking outside the box. And uh, it's, it's, they're fun comics. They're very, he's a child of 70s Marvel, and they're very much in the spirit of 70s and 80s Marvel. And, uh, you know, uh, Sal Buscema is still inking and, and doing a wonderful job. And uh, Glenn Whitmore is coloring it. it. It's just it's very solid product that I'm very proud to be a part of. Uh, but yeah. And uh, do you have any if you have any links or any info, please send it to me so I can put it in the show notes for this episode. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's sitcomics.net is the, uh, the 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 main uh a spot on the web that people can find and then you can find uh, a lot of reviews uh, because they're available on comiXology okay. uh, initially as chapters and then they're gathered for print in what Darren calls binge books hmm. that are like 60 pages of story for uh, for like five bucks, four bucks. Oh, that's bucks. not bad. No, it's a fantastic deal and uh uh, and I can't wait for it to get in front of more eyes. You know, I mean, we've been very gratified with the response so far from shop owners and from from readers. But uh, you know, the more people we get in front of, the better. And uh, as I said, I think it's I think it's terrific product. So hopefully, a lot of people will agree with me. Oh yeah. But that's my day to day. That's my uh, main gig, uh, along with doing commissions through CatskillComics.com. Uh, and between those two, I have plenty of work and uh, and have uh, fallen behind currently so I'm playing catch up uh, even though I've been doing this 30 some years I I seem to always be feeling like I'm playing catch up so and follow this man on Facebook <laughs> one of these days I'll get I'll get this right so <laughs> that's what I'm waiting for it may take another few years I may have to be in this gig 40 years before I finally get it right but I'm I'm, I'm trying all the time all right. Well, th again, thank thank you for uh, once again sharing your time with me. It's my pleasure, sir. All right. Thank thank you, sir. Like I said, I'm sure I'll hit you up sometime in the future. <laughs> All right. I look forward to it. You All take right. care of yourself, Phil. Thank you. You too. Bye bye now. Bye.